I want to start with a question, and uh, I'm going to put it in the chat in the live stream because I know there's a bit of a delay here. But the question I want to ask, and I'd invite your feedback uh, in the chat, is how would you describe the perfect family? How would you describe the perfect family? So if you're on Facebook or YouTube, I think you can chat on YouTube as well. Um, feel free, or if you're just embarrassed to be public, you can text me. Uh, but how would you describe the perfect family in a word or two or a short description? And uh, maybe think about your family of origin. And I'm going to put a little picture up on the screen that uh, maybe just to get you thinking about your family of origin. There's uh, three cuties there. That's actually me and my two sisters when we were little. And uh, as I was thinking about this question, how would you describe the perfect family? Um, I was thinking about my family of origin, not that we were perfect, no family is perfect. And even in asking that question, that's something that I realize is that we all have our own background, our own story, and even the family we might find ourselves in now, if you're a mom or dad or a young adult, um, you know, this is a complicated question when you think about your own family because we have this mix of sort of, you know, the brokenness of our lives uh, and the ideals of what we'd like and, uh, so yeah, how would you describe the perfect family? And I'm just going to share some of the responses that might be coming in here. Um, yeah, I've never met or observed a perfect family. We all have flaws. This is true. So if you could dream for a moment, you know, what would be that perfect family? Does there, is there any thoughts? And I'm hoping maybe some people might share a few things. And if not, you know, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. But um, how about love? You know, unconditional love, a space where you are loved and accepted uh, for who you are. That might be part of a, a perfect family. Um, maybe joy, maybe laughter. You guys are really shy today. Loving, there we go. Anybody else have some comments coming in? Okay, here we go. Yeah, some laughter, perfect family. What are we talking about? Uh, loving, generous. Uh, there's a few things coming in here. I don't know if this is really working because we've got about a minute delay on the chat and me talking. So, yeah, I'll, you know, I feel like I'm kind of blabbing here. But, yeah, the responses will come in. Um, Terry says his family is near perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> Maybe we should go all move in with him and ruin his family for him. <laughs> uh, anything else here? Perfect family. How would you describe the perfect family? One of the things I was thinking of, uh, trying to narrow this down a little bit, okay, here we go. Loving, supportive, compassionate. Yeah, keep the responses coming in. Feel free to keep them coming in as I'm talking here. Accepting, forgiving, that's a big one. Um, yeah, there's probably lots that we could be thinking about even if you're not putting it in the chat. The perfect family. So as I was thinking about this and, uh, and this, uh, you know, picture of me and my two sisters, not that we were perfect or had this perfect family, um, but there's things about my family that I appreciate, and I think the concept of family is uh, it should be a place where we are sort of nurtured and developed and uh, a space where we can grow and mature. That picture of, of me and my sisters, that was us years ago, and the idea of family is that we are to grow, we are to develop, we are to mature. I don't look the same as I did in that picture that I just shared. I've, I've grown up, outwardly at least, maybe not inwardly, but uh, it's a place to grow and develop and mature. And if you think about family as sort of a safe place, uh, a place where um, in, the, in the stresses of life and the challenges that we might face in the world, family is a place that's supposed to help build us up in our inner being, to help us become uh, stronger, uh, to help us to be able to handle the, the challenges of life and the world in which we live. Um, there's some other responses coming in here. A family that prays together. Uh, the friends family was uh, another one. Um, family being near or far, there's love. Yeah, so there's lots of, uh, of good things. Uh, and I think maybe I'm not seeing all the comments coming in. I'm just getting a text from my daughter that there's lots of people saying lots of stuff. So I'm obviously not seeing everything. Um, but uh, as we think about this sort of perfect family, think about this idea of it being uh, an atmosphere for growth and support and, develop and development and maturity. And, and like I said earlier, I recognize that family is a bit of a, it's a difficult 
concept sometimes based on our upbringing, based on our background, based on the fact that we live in a broken world and we're all broken people. Uh, we have this sinful nature that is at war within us and so all the good that we want to see in our family is often tainted by our mistakes and our failures and our brokenness. And so I want to kind of shift gears from our earthly family and I should say Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I haven't done that yet. So Happy Mother's Day. Thanks for tuning in. I want to shift gears from our earthly family to our heavenly family, to a whole new family, and an invitation that all of us have to this whole new family. In John chapter 1, verses 12 to 13, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, talking about Jesus, who all, yet to all who did receive Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. To all who have received Jesus, we've been born again. We've entered into a whole new family. We've entered the family of God. And if you think about our earthly family or the, the family that we grew up in um, and you kind of shift gears, you know, you think about the ideals and the, the perfections that you'd love to see in your earthly family, uh, think about the reality of being part of a heavenly family, part of our heavenly family through Jesus and being born again into this whole new family. We've been born into a spiritual family and this spiritual family is an eternal family. And the idea with this family of God kind of image is that this is a family that we are meant to live in, in the here and now, and on for eternity. And we've been in this series the last few weeks about uh, resurrection, this whole new world, and talking about resurrection realities, and we've been talking about heaven and hell, and our resurrected bodies, and the whole idea of our eternal hope that exists because Jesus was raised from the dead, and we too will be raised and, uh, and we'll experience life ever after with him. And as you think about this invitation to a whole new family, this is a family for the here and now and for eternity. And this morning what I want us to do is sort of think about the reality of this eternal family in the here and now. I know our series we've been talking about sort of eternity and resurrection and life beyond the grave. But I kind of feel like we're in a season right now, we're in days right now, where maybe we need some encouragement for the here and now. And so I want you to just kind of get your head in this space of, if you've received Jesus, you're a part of this new family, this family that is a spiritual family, an eternal family. There's eternal realities about it, but those eternal realities can be lived out in the here and now. And if you haven't received Jesus, if you're not a part of this family, maybe some, some of where we go this morning will be an encouragement to you to consider joining the family, to receiving that invitation from Jesus to become a child of God. Carla mentioned earlier that I put a post on Facebook uh, earlier this week, and I posted it to our group, our church group. So OAC Community Online is our Facebook group. If you're a part of our church family and you're not part of that Facebook group and you're on Facebook and would like to be a part of it, you can uh, request to be uh, in, uh, joining, you can request to join that group and, and we'll, uh, we'll let you in. Uh, just, uh, it's, it's meant for our church family. And so I put a question on that group chat uh, this week, just about how are you doing? And Carla mentioned this earlier, there was lots of responses, but um, we're going through difficult days again with these COVID realities and increased restrictions. And like I said, it's kind of like flashbacks to a year ago. It feels like we're taking steps backwards instead of steps forward. And I know that we're all sort of dealing with this in different ways and we're, we're experiencing it in different ways. And, and, uh, and you could see from the responses on Facebook, just the, the vast, uh, the variety of responses of how people are doing and how we're processing life these days. And so this morning, I really do want to just encourage us as a church family, as part of this whole new family, this family of God. And I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 3. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. And what I want to do is read a prayer from the Apostle Paul. It was a prayer for the church in Ephesus. 
a prayer for the family of God, which I believe is a prayer that we can relate to today. It's a prayer for us today. The OAC family, church family, this is a prayer for you. And so I'm going to read this passage. We'll talk about it a little bit. And my hope is that the things that Paul is praying for will encourage your hearts and lives in these challenging days that we find ourselves in. And that this passage, this prayer will help draw us together as the family of God. So here's God's word for us this morning. Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And let me just add this prayer. Jesus, we come to your word this morning and we invite you to speak. We gather as the Okotoks Alliance Church family today, scattered wherever we find ourselves, but together in you, united in you. And so, Father God, we invite you to speak to us through your word this morning. We invite you to minister to our hearts. We invite you to encourage us with your word today. We pray this in your name. Amen. As I mentioned the, the, my question on Facebook this week, there was lots of responses. Exhausted, depressed, disappointed, frustrated, angry, uh, censored was another one. I can't say how I honestly feel because I don't think it would be appropriate on this, this feed. Um, you know, there was lots of responses. And I think wherever you are this morning, however you're doing, however you're feeling, I want to invite you to come to God's word this morning, just as you are. Come to Jesus this morning, just as you are. Because however you're feeling, it's okay. That's how you're feeling. And however you're coming this morning, just be open to the fact that Jesus might want to speak to you. He might want to minister to your heart. And whatever it is that you're feeling, however it is you're doing, he has a word for you this morning. So we look at this prayer from the Apostle Paul and he kind of, there's three things I just want to draw out of this prayer that he is praying for, for the church in Ephesus, and I would say praying for us today. And the first thing is that Paul prays for strength. He prays for strength in verse, uh, verses 16 to the first part of 17. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. As we think about this prayer for strength, uh, just a couple things I want to point out here. He talks about um, that his, his prayer is that he may strengthen you with power. And the kind of power that Paul is talking about is actually revealed in chapter one. There's another prayer from Paul and he says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul is praying for the power of God to be at work in our lives. And that power is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Resurrection power. Just think about that for a moment. When Jesus died on the cross, three days later he was raised to life. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. 
Paul's praying for resurrection power in our lives. He talks about this power strengthening our inner being. And again, I just think of some of the comments on Facebook this week that I think are representative of how many of us are feeling, right? Exhausted, discouraged. I would have added maybe depleted. Um, Languishing was another word. You know, these words were, it's like a desire for energy, a desire for strength, a desire for power. And God wants to minister resurrection power into our hearts to strengthen us in our inner being so that we'd have the internal resources to be able to handle the external pressures that we're facing. Another just observation here in Paul's request for for strength, in verse 17 he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I think it wasn't so much that he's praying for, for Christ to actually dwell in the hearts of people, Jesus dwells in our hearts when we receive him. We have the Holy Spirit residing in us. And maybe Paul's praying for an awareness that Christ is dwelling in their hearts. And I would say that that's our prayer for us this morning, that we would have an awareness that Jesus is with us. When Jesus left his disciples after he was resurrected and about to ascend to heaven, his final words to his disciples were, I will never, or sorry, he says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. It's this promise that even though Jesus was going away physically, spiritually, he would reside with us through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now just think about that for a moment. Have you ever gone through something really difficult by yourself? And you've thought, man, it would be really great if somebody was just here with me, just to have the presence of a friend or a family member. I was remembering back to when my kids were smaller and uh, we would have to take them for, uh, for a shot, you know, for a vaccine or to get blood drawn and maybe that's a relevant, you know, that's a helpful metaphor in these days of shots and vaccines and stuff like that. Maybe you don't like needles. Uh, my kids never liked needles. And so either Tammy or myself would have to go with our kids and literally hold them on our lap while the nurse was trying to jab this needle into their arm. But the, our presence with them helped give them courage. We didn't do anything for them. We didn't take the needle for them. They had to take the needle. But just us being with them helped give them courage and strength to face the challenge. And I think in a similar way, we as children of God need to have an awareness that Jesus is with us. Another response on Facebook this week was this feeling of being alone. And I don't know if you're feeling that as well. You know, we've got increased restrictions and isolation and further separation from one another. And maybe you're feeling alone. Maybe you're feeling lonely. Maybe you're watching this morning by yourself and you're feeling alone. And I want you to know that you are not alone. Jesus is with you. And so Paul's praying that we would know that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. And this will give us strength. So that's the first sort of uh, aspect, first request that Paul prays for strength. The second thing we see, if we read on in verse 17, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Paul's praying that the Ephesian believers would be rooted and established in love, that they would know Christ's love and and the vastness of Christ's love. And it kind of poses the question, do you feel like you know the love of God? Do you feel like you know the love of Christ in all its fullness? Do you know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ? Are you rooted in his love? Have you grasped it? Here's a few other verses just about God's love for us. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Just picture this. God the Father lavishing his love on his children. Or in the Psalms, 
there's a, a phrase that's repeated throughout the Psalms of God's unfailing love. I've been reading through the Psalms the last little bit. Me and a, a few other guys, we're reading through Scripture together. And we're in the Psalms right now. And there's this phrase of, about God's unfailing love or everlasting love. And it's repeated throughout the Psalms. And let me just read a few. I printed off a bunch here. But let me just read a few to help us soak in God's love for us today. So the psalmist says in Psalm 6, verse 4, Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. God's unfailing love saves us. Psalm 13, verse 5, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Psalm 33, verse 22, May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Psalm 36, verse 7, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. God's love provides safety and security for us. We can take refuge in him. Psalm 48, verse 9, within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. We often sing songs of God's amazing love, and it's an opportunity for us to be reminded and to meditate on his unfailing love. Psalm 51, David wrote this psalm after being confronted by the prophet Nathan after he'd committed sin with Bathsheba. He committed adultery and then sent her husband into the front lines of battle and basically had him executed there. And he's confronted with this sin and this is how he starts out Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. God's unfailing love is a forgiving love. He blots out our transgressions. Psalm 90 verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love. We can be satisfied in God's love. Psalm 119 verse 41 is a cry out, may your unfailing love come to me. And then again, verse 76, may your unfailing love be my comfort. And in verse 88, in your unfailing love, preserve my life. God's love is unfailing. God's love is unending. God's love is everlasting. And Paul prays that the believers would be rooted and established in this love and have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. How many of us can say that we fully grasp the extent of God's love for us? May we be reminded of his love this morning. And then the third part of Paul's prayer, a third request in here at the end of verse 19. He says, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And again, if you think about just how are you doing these days and think about some of the comments that we saw on Facebook this week of how people are doing. There's this sense of people feeling maybe depleted or, or empty or just you know, nothing left in the tank. And Paul's prayer is that we would be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, filled with his power, his resurrection power, filled with his love, his unfailing love, filled with all the fullness of God. How many of you need to be filled this morning? This passage, as I said earlier, is a bit of a, a reminder of this sort of or it's, it's this already not yet reality. We're part of the family of God and there's all these things that God wants to pour out into our lives and it's meant for the here and now and it's also kind of a not yet. And as we kind of pray this prayer into our hearts and over our lives, there's maybe a sense of, am I ever gonna live in this reality? And the answer is probably not quite yet. <laughs> Because these realities are also eternal realities that we really won't experience in their fullness until, the, until life in the resurrection, life beyond the grave. But my hope and my prayer as we pray this prayer is that these realities, will, we will begin to taste them in our lives. That we will taste some of that resurrection power that God wants to pour out into our hearts that we will taste some of the fullness of his love for us, that we will grasp that we are not alone, that we will grasp that he has not given up on us, that we will grasp that he is there for us in whatever it is that we're going through. 
God wants to fill us. And he wants to fill us to the point of overflowing. His power to be at work in our lives so it can be at work through our lives and we can reach out and minister to one another. His love poured out into our lives so it can be poured out through our lives to love others and to be compassionate and gracious in this season of great upheaval that many of us find ourselves in. So this prayer is a prayer that I want to pray over us. But before I do that, I also want to encourage you. Church family, we are scattered this morning. And for the next couple of Sundays, we'll be scattered. And prayer, as I was just thinking about this passage and felt led to talk about this passage, just to to use this as a model of what prayer can look like for one another. That in this season of increased restrictions and in this season of isolation, there is a ministry that we can be involved in for one another, and that's the ministry of prayer. And as we see people interact on social media or as we reach out and text somebody and say, hey, how are you doing? Or if we pick up the phone and call them, whatever their response to us is, we can respond through prayer. We maybe can't go and be with them. We can't go and have a coffee with them. We can't say, hey, see you next Sunday in church. But we can be praying for one another. And the ministry of prayer, if it's one of the only things we can do, it's probably the best thing we can do. And beyond life in restrictions and isolation, maybe this would be a habit that we would learn to engage in for one another. To be praying for God's strength, to be praying for God's love, to be praying for God's fullness to be manifest in each of our lives. So I want to encourage you today or this week, reach out to somebody. Ask them how you can pray for them. Ask them how you can encourage them with a word of prayer. Use Paul's example here in Ephesians 3 as a model for prayer that uh, we can be involved in for one another. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come and, and lead us in a moment. Let me just pray this prayer again over us. And if you're at home, just bow your hearts with me as I literally read Paul's prayer and receive this as our prayer for you this morning. So for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.